Hello everyone, Daryl here, and I am taking a look at a photo taken by Ron Stewart of the Horsehead and Flame Nebulas. And in a Patreon forum for Nebula Photos, he had shared his original stacked images output from Pix Insight as well as Cyril. And I've never used either of those for my stacking. I, I normally use Deep Sky Stacker, which is from what I've seen, much more fundamental level program. But uh, in any case, I was just curious to see what I could obtain from his data, being that I have shot some images of the same nebulas in the past and never been particularly happy with my results. And I was just curious to see how things looked. Um, editing images taken by someone using a different uh, camera setup. I don't recall what Ryan uses, but in any case, what you see here are two images of the original stacks. And he has since uh, provided the one on the right from Cyril, which was in FITS format in a TIFF format. So I downloaded that since I could edit TIFFs in Photoshop, which is my primary application that I do my astrophotography editing with so far. And here is the image that he came up with, which I think looks quite good. It's got uh, you know, quite a bit of noise in it, which is, I've, that just seems to be the norm when you're really stretching these images out quite a bit. And I haven't really learned all of the techniques for minimizing noise myself yet. I think basically you have to capture more images and just have a longer integration period is the biggest thing to help boost the signal to noise ratio. But regardless of that, I, I like the image he has here quite well. It, it does strike me as looking similar to some of the work I've had. And what I've really been yearning for is to capture more detail around that horse head looking uh, void, I guess you'd call it there, in that n red nebulosity. But I've got a feeling that really only comes with more advanced uh, astrophotography equipment and filters, notably. So what one can get of the Horsehead Nebula with just a standard camera and lens as I shoot with, I don't know. In any case, uh, I am redoing my editing session because in an earlier recording of it, uh, my OBS 64 software that I was capturing my screen with, I had set it for the application. And as it turns out, when you do that, it doesn't record drop down menus, pop up windows and all that. So it was really kind of hard to tell what I was doing. You just see a cursor dancing on screen. So instead, what I'm going to do here, I've already kind of gone ahead and done a brief bit of editing. So now I can back up and just kind of talk to it. This is the image as I obtained it upon dropping the TIFF that was provided into Photoshop. And it's not what I was expecting. I don't know if uh, Ron generated the TIFF a different way from maybe how he generated the files that are shown here in the smaller thumbnails. But I was expecting to see, you know, the, this greenish cast. And the fact that I didn't kind of threw me a curve. I wasn't sure what that meant insofar as how I might attack it because I have done some editing of my own images in the past that similar to Ron's had a greenish or bluish cast to them. And one of the program plugins I use for Photoshop is called Astro Flat Pro. I'm just going to pop it open to give you a little quick view of what it looks like. <clears throat> um, where is it? RC Astro. No. It's Pro Digital Software. So this is Astro Flat Pro, and it has three sliders, one for smoothness, one for edge cleanup, and one for dark noise reduction. And typically the approach with this is you adjust the smoothness value until you see it start bringing out the details around your 
uh, deep sky objects. And then you stop before it really starts causing the overall sky to bloom. And just as I'm sliding it here, you can see on screen, there's virtually nothing happening. And likewise, well, edge cleanup then comes into play. Once you've uh, adjusted your smoothness, edge cleanup may fill around the, fill in the perimeter edges in case you start getting a bit of a vignetting effect. So it kind of balances out the edges and makes them look nicer. And finally, your dark noise reduction does just that. It helps reduce the noise in the dark areas. But in any case, uh, this image, it wasn't giving me anything to work with. And despite various efforts that I tried, I was getting nothing. So I played around for a while and finally came to a point of deciding maybe there was just something about this uh, TIFF image that Ron provided that I wasn't going to be able to do anything. But then I thought, just out of curiosity, let's try this. Let's go in and apply the auto color filter. It is, that's something I never do. I mean, I so rarely use auto color because being automatic, I don't know what it's done to my image. I would rather kind of know the intermediate steps to get where it gets. And that actually kind of made me wonder, well, what is auto color? So I looked that up on uh, online and auto color adjusts the contrast and color of an image by searching the image to identify shadows, midtones, and highlights. By default, auto color neutralizes the midtones using a target color of RGB 128 gray and clips the shadows and highlight pixels by a half percent. So that's from Adobe describing what uh, auto color does. So I'm like, well, adjusting contrast and color by searching and modifying shadows, midtones, etc. That sounds a lot like what we're often doing typically in uh, some of the astrophotography editing I've seen folks doing with the levels adjustments. So this time I just decided, let's just tackle it the way I normally would, not using AstroFlat Pro this time, however, and just jumping right into the levels. So because I do like to work with as much data as possible, I left it in the 32 bit per channel mode as I typically do. And we'll change that mode later. But for now, the first thing I did, I went in and applied a levels layer. And for that layer, what I did was I saw that my reds were virtually absent. And I could have adjusted the midtones, but I just wasn't sure what was going to go on here because everything looks just like little spikes slam far to the left. So instead I decided just to work with the RGB, RGB composite value and I brought this midtone slider in to just where I barely see the start of the histogram curve on the right edge. And that gave me this value of whatever I had there, 5.98. This is something I, I really wish this dialogue could be expanded. And uh, the only way I really know to do that would be directly apply the levels edits, which I guess I could do. I know the values there are 0, 5.98 5 and 255. And I did not change the red, green, or blue. So, let me just duplicate this layer in case I mess things up. And I'm going to say this is the RGB levels applied. And we will simply do that very thing. Just change the midtones to 5.98 and apply the levels directly. And really, it looks like even this dialog box isn't so much bigger as I was thinking. So there's really nothing gained by that. Okay, I scratched that idea. I was thinking that Levels dialog was a lot bigger than it was. So we first stretched the midtone RGB values. 
I say stretch, we, well, I guess that's right. But we bring in the midtones to 5.98 on the RGB. Then I add another levels layer. And for this now, I tackle the per channel values, leaving the composite RGB alone. And I only adjust the midtones. I could probably do blacks or shadows and midtones in one fell swoop, but I just kind of wanted to take an incremental approach. So I brought in the mids on the red to 1.70, just again, the start of the right edge of the histogram. And likewise for green, and that's 1.20. And finally for blue, also 1.20. It looks like that's actually just shy of where the curve starts. But I'll leave those alone because it, well, let's see. Let's tweak those a little. Not sure how much difference it will make, if any. 1.26 on green. And red is okay. And blue actually looks pretty good on 1.24. So very minor change there on the green level. So I've got that applied. And then I worked on the shadows. So for that, still on a per channel basis, we brought in the reds until we had the, dark, the shadows brought into the left side of the curve. So 113. And making an adjustment on the blacks causes your midpoint to shift. Just, I'll show you that there. So as I brought the reds over to, to the left, the midpoints shifted off. Well, no, I said that wrong. As I brought the shadows from the left toward the left edge of the histogram, i.e. moving the slider right, it caused the midpoint slider likewise to move toward the right. So with that happening, I simply brought it back down again to where the curve starts. And we can start seeing a little bit more of the data popping out there in the curve, in the uh, image. And then likewise, do the same thing again for green. So align the points. And for blue. And there's the result we had. Uh, hmm. Curiously enough, there is a change I've made in there somewhere that does not bring me to that same end result as I previously had, which looks much better. So I've done something wrong here. Oh, there, there's something wrong for sure. That slide, I don't know how that slider there got so skewed. Hmm. And that looks okay. Green looks okay. Blue looks okay. Red, as we intended. Green. These all seem to be as I had set them, well, what was I seeing a minute ago? I wonder. I don't know. All I know is the image here. We've got so much more green, and I saw a setting there a moment ago where the greens looked out of whack.
Did I, no, it was before I turned that level on to compare. Well, I may have done something here more than I realized. <clears throat> it may be that I did not adjust the midpoint slider on that last step as I had thought. So let's just remove those levels. Okay. And here our image, I mean, it's, it looks blown out, but it's still more consistent with what I would expect. So here I added another levels layer. went in per channel to red and brought in the blacks, the shadows. I may have, maybe I allowed the midtones to shift. That's starting to seem more familiar because I wasn't sure what impact it would have to bring those in. We may have just seen that. It just completely overdoes the colors yeah I think that this is what happened so the last step is strictly one of bringing in our blacks and that looks much better now let's see how that compares to my earlier image yeah well that's a little bit brighter so <laughs> Things are never the same in Photoshop. Can never do them twice the same exact way. Oh, I know. I had already scrubbed it directly with some curves. So l let me just get rid of that layer. Okay, so what we want to do now is create a merge layer of the visibles which is control alt shift e or n rather and then return and e nope i did that wrong I, that opened a new file I'm trying to do this the old fashioned way control alt n no There we go, control shift N and control shift E. Still not quite what I thought. I wanted to undo the old oh, merge visible. So the problem was, well, <clears throat> yeah, I had background on what I'm wanting to do. I forget the shortcut, but uh, I've got it as a mapped action that I call add merged layer. And what I'm wanting to do is duplicate these layers and merge them together. I know one way to do that is I could group them or I can duplicate them that way and simply do a merge. Okay, so that's, the, that's one way to go about it without using my little button there that hides things from you watching. So now that we have this layer, we're going to add some curves to it. I'll just rename what we did to it. Merge original plus light plus levels. Now we're going to add a curves layer and select the scrubbing tool and just go over here into a nice dark area that doesn't have a whole lot of other color hues that will be moving our cursor across and scrub downwards to darken. It's not responding. Why is that?
All right. Hmm. Just uh, lack of response there for some reason. Let's undo that. Photoshop seems to be lagging on me or something here. Okay, I guess it is undone. That's why there's I'm getting a can't do option there. What's that done? I'm not sure. Okay, anyway. So we've got the scrub tool active. We'll go over to the blacks. Scrub down to darken them, and they're, they're they're not responding as much as I expected. Okay, now let's try a different area here, just outside some of that fringing red of the nebula. And again, that's still the it's it's chained the points far left. So let's just go directly to our curve and we'll drag that down a little don't really like quite what I'm getting there but let's go with that now we'll go into the reds here magentas of the horse head and brighten them by stroking up and that's not doing what I expected. Daryl, what did you do different from before? I don't know. I'm not sure if it's these options on the curves layer that I'm messing up or not. I'm going to delete that layer and look, let's look at directly applying the curves, which probably is what I did previously because I saw no layer above the one that was existing. And once again, we'll just simply go to the scrubber tool, move into the blacks, Not getting much result there. Maybe I went over into the more nebulous area. Something seems to be quite laggy in the computer. It's having trouble. Let me cancel that. Let's see if I can scroll back or not. No. no I've made enough changes that in the history I've lost track of the earlier steps I had. So at this point, I mean, I'm, I'm wanting to make things richer. I, I want to boost my contrast, get the blacks blacker and the reds, the other color tones brighter and more intense. Tell you what, this may help speed things up. I'm going to purge everything. My every, Oh yeah, let's purge everything. Okay. Let's try returning to the uh, levels adjustment once more. Maybe I don't think this is what I did, but it might have been. Doesn't look like it. 
of what I'm seeing of a histogram. No. So it wasn't a levels adjustment. I did think it was curves. So we add a curve layer. I may have just simply put an S curve on it. Definitely not that direction. Is that helping at all? It brightened it. But otherwise it did nothing to benefit. Well, I, I do like how that's shrinking on attack some. Let's see. Shrunk it a little anyway. That is bumping up the brightness. Let's adjust this point. That's really messing up the stars, the cleanliness of the corona around them. Auto color as a starting point may have done more for me than I realized. I mean, that's sort of the difference in this approach. What's that look like compared to without the curves? Just brighter. <clears throat> Let's see that if we add a levels layer now we can darken just the RGB start clipping the shadows Well, let's see. oh, we're, we are still also in 32-bit mode, which I believe for auto color, I had to be in 16-bit in color. So let's just leave it at this point. And go ahead and do our... 16 bit conversion. Don't merge, and by not merging the layers, 
it will by default do an exposure and gamma type of adjustment. Everything looks identical to before. And with that done, we can now view the histogram on the file. And our red and blue are pretty well lined up. Green is, I'm sorry, red and green are lined up. Blue is offset. So let's go in with a levels layer. And we're going to first just kind of line up the blue. And I'm not entirely sure what value it has. This is just always something I like to experiment with. But I like to make all three channels roughly the same width and shape to what extent is possible. The way they taper off on the right, you know, you can't really change that. But the width of it, we can change by bringing in the midpoint, I believe. So we bring in the mid. I'm not worried yet about the shift. In fact, if we bring it all the way into where the curve starts, that looks like that may be about right. Now we adjust the black point to bring the blues back over, keeping them aligned to the left edge of the red. And overall, that stretched the pulse width, I'll call it, of the curve. So we want to shrink that back down just a little bit of trial and error to get things positioned and spread consistent with the other curves that looks like it's about right now for green we'll do the same thing compress it down to widen it Bring in the blacks to shift it left. And then once again, adjust the mids to make it about the same size as the other two. Readjust the blacks to line it up better. Whoops. Just blew that. Okay, that's good. Blue looks like it's a little shifted left still. Let's go with that. Okay, and um, we can make them all darker, but I'm going to do that with a separate light layer. Another levels layer. happen to it oh somehow I moved it into the other box okay levels layer if we just bring it in on the RGB that'll darken everything together not sure if I like that result though not bad Bring in the midpoint slider. It starts bumping things up. Let's see how it looks like on a per channel basis. Darken the reds. Greens. Blues. Back 
not to fall asleep at my desk. Okay, there's the blues. So the width are still about the same. The red kind of goes in a little further than the others. And let's just see what that looks like before and after. So there's after, there's before. So it, it definitely darkens some, maybe not as much as I was expecting. So let's try one more levels and do it, apply it on the RGB. Well, the RGB is fully left. So that's as much as we can really do, short of just clipping it, clipping the blacks, which, well, that might actually work okay. Start losing some of that feathered out flame nebula. Yeah, let's not do that. Okay, so I've got those three levels. Let's do another merge layer and apply curves. Let's hide the histogram. Go to our scrub tool, select a dark area. Oh, that's not going to work. Let's go to our horsehead nebulosity and we'll brighten that some. Keep the, or keeping an eye on the curve. We don't want to see things getting clipped off up there on it. And our flame. Can't do anything more with it without driving things into being clipped. Now let's go back to the blacks. Not working too well. Okay, got a feeling I may need to do some noise cleanup before I really try and work anymore on getting some nicer black densities. Put a marker right there. Asleep. I'll put people asleep watching this if I fall asleep doing it. Well, taking it down a little bit there helps. I'm going to call that good right there, but I want to adjust this curve at the upper point to keep it from being clipped right about like that. Okay, so with that all done, 
let's yet again create another merged copy. And go into camera raw filter. And here, I, the first thing I want to do, I think, is attack the noise. So we'll go into a darkish area. Let's just try right in here. Color noise reduction. Need to zoom in more. Tell you what, let's try up here on the flame nebula. It might be better even. Take out just enough color noise that we no longer see the distinct color tones. Looks a little more grayish. Yeah, that sounds about right. 12 to 15. And then blend that a little bit with some noise reduction. And add some sharpening. Preserve the preserve a few details there. Okay. Haven't lost too much of the details, keeping in mind we're zoomed in. Let's look at it on the whole. Yeah, that's an improvement. Okay, and now we'll go to basic. Let's check our color temperature. It's pretty good as it is, right at zero. Bump it up just a couple to give it a little bit more of a, a little more intensity on the reds, warming them a little. Tint, I'm gonna leave a lot of exposure, looks pretty good. Now we can bring it down just a little, it gives it maybe a little boost in contrast by adjusting exposure, but let's directly hit the contrast and see what that does for us. Shrinks the star glow a little. I still don't want to lose too much of that nebulosity of the flame nebula though. And boosting contrast does take some of that away. Again, just use a small amount there, I think. Ten. Highlights, that should pull down the stars some. Yeah. Shadows, I don't think we want to do anything with them. Nope. Leave them at zero. As again, I'm nodding off. The whites, we can. Can't punch them up much because that really makes the stars bloom. But it also helps get rid of the fringing. So we'll just go gradual, plus 15. And the blacks, pull them down some. Dehaze. I like this one. It's kind of fun to play with, see what it might do for us. Let 
Maybe not so much this time. I don't really see much benefit from dehaze, so let's pump up the saturation a little more intensity on the colors. I won't go quite as overboard with it as I did before. That's pretty good. 15, 20. Okay. Struggling, struggling with my getting sleepy. So clarity punches up some of the apparent sharpness in the flame nebula. And I like that. But it also hits our stars. So I will just mask those stars impacts out later okay so we'll go with that oh and optics let's see if we can get rid of the blue uh, chroma here around the stars and the orange Struggling, struggling, struggling. We're getting sleepy. Just cleaning up the blue helps, but it seems like I've lost that. Not bad. Let's give that a go and see what we've got. Okay. That looks pretty good, I think. Now let's put a mask on that. And select our paintbrush pretty good size and it's softly feathered the flows 50% so I can put it down pretty gradually on the stars and restore I thought not seeing much happen not really doing much okay so that's not really doing any good delete the layer mask okay 
where's that glow coming from? It's not so much from Camera Raw, although Camera Raw is bringing in a shift of the tent. Hmm. Looks like the curves adjustment is what did that to us. Okay, so before I even mess with camera raw, if we could shrink those stars some, it would probably help. I do have star shrink as a plug in from uh, Richard Croman Astrophotography. Is that right? RC Astro. So let's uh, turn off our curves for a moment and just look at that earlier layer and see what Star Shrink does for us. Let's go up here and look at all attack as our big guy. Crank in a high strength, maximum reduction. That looks pretty good. So we'll okay that. That helps. So the question might be, um, how effectively could we reduce those stars without that particular filter? Let me just undo do that and I'm going to duplicate this layer and I'm going to reapply the filter to it with the settings used so there's how it looks and we'll compare that Let's duplicate the layer once again to a more manual approach of reducing the star size by going into filter for, or no, I'm sorry, select color range for highlights and grayscale. So we're set for that. Go pretty fuzzy to pick up more stars. We're not hitting our nebulosity much at all there, if any. So that looks good at that level, I think. And we'll expand that selection now. By five pixels. Sounds good. And then feather the selection. Half the amount. And I hear some beeping. Let's see if anyone's trying to talk with me in that forum. Nope, there's others. Okay, so we've got a feathered selection that we've, let's turn that off now so we can see the details. And we'll go in and filter median, uh, let's see, median noise. Which 
11 was way too much. So one, the radius of one removes them quite a lot. Two. This probably does more for removing or reducing the intensity of the stars than it does really shrinking the core of them. not having much impact. Okay, it's not really affecting the size, so I'm not going to worry about that just yet. Um, star shrink does help. So, I guess I'll... <clears throat> I'll stick with using star shrink, although it's not something everyone has. It is a pretty nice little plug-in, very straightforward to use, you know, just a few little sliders on it. So, at this point, I feel like things are looking pretty good. We had the curves that brighten things up some. Which is still kind of exaggerating the stars. But we should be able to undo that with a mask edit. Was that layer this was I don't remember what that layer two was from earlier was that after another levels adjustment maybe or that that may be my old original layer that I was just kind of comparing against I want to delete it since I don't remember. And we'll make a merged copy. I mean, at least that much is probably the same thing as what I had done in getting to that layer two. If we look at it, let's look at levels again. Not much room. They all look like the curves are pretty evenly affected. I really don't like how those stars look. Makes me wonder, did that come in? It must have come in with our levels edits, levels edits earlier.
whatever I did on that layer one is I think that's where we did the sh yeah that's where we did the star shrink and it kind of brought in that little donut shaped shadow around it so let's just that kind of keeps things easy we'll just ignore star shrink let me get rid of this layer again then because that's propagating the error forward Now that curves adjustment is kind of affecting them too. Okay. So we'll take that out. A lot of trial and error backtracking on steps as you explore the how to's of all this. So at this point, I would still like to try and get rid of some of this. Hmm. Some of that color cast. I don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to mess up our horse head nebula. So I'm going to try something here. I'm going to add a fill layer. Solid color fill layer. Just accept the color that's there. Am I still selected on things? No. Okay. Um, now, it's kind of interesting how that. Why did that magnify the stars? That's strange. I may not have selected the right thing. It looks like I did, though. Let's try it again. It's a layer. New fill layer, solid color. Okay, then. All right, that looks more like what I'm after. Okay, so with that done, we're now going to turn it off for a minute and look at the previous layer. We're going to zoom in on it. Select our eyedropper tool, point sample, and we're going to grab this kind of deep magenta reddish tone. That's a little darker than I thought it would be. It's because I'm not on the right layer. Let me get on layer one. Okay. So I click and select it. Still don't think I want to go quite that. Well, maybe I do want to go that dark. We'll see what happens. Then turn on our color fill layer. Click on the main layer. And we want to fill that with the sampled color. Our, you know, okay, I keep forgetting. That's that's a like a vectored, vectorized layer. So you click on that on the icon. And now we for the color picker we can just go over here to the uh, little swatch box on the left select the color there that we sampled and okay that cancel okay let's shrink our image and I don't think this is going to work but let's just try a divide at this point yeah that's what I thought that's definitely not what we want So let's duplicate the prior layer one and invert it so our blacks are more, well, our blacks become whites. Like so. Which also means our color bias is a different hue. So the color field really is wrong. So using our inverted colors here, we're going to go for an averaged sample. Let's 
31 by 31 average. Pick that as our color. Go back to our color fill and change that. Go to our little swatches on the left to grab that color. We've got that. And then we're going to divide it against the prior layer to remove that cast, which looks too subtle to believe it would even do anything. And with all layers hidden that we're not interested in, we will make a merge copy of those. One way to do it too is just duplicate the layers together and right click and select merge layers. Or we can just turn off the prior two. So the, this new layer, we want to now invert it back to black background. Let's see if that removed some of the undesired color cast. Boy, we lost, a, or no, I thought we lost a lot. <laughs> it's in the wrong part of the image. We did lose a lot though, actually. We lost a lot in the nebula, as I thought we might but it cleaned up the blacks nicely. So what we could do at this point is just paint back in the nebula with a mask. So we'll turn on the uh, layer one that we kind of drove all this from, add a mask to this current layer, reselect our black brush, and brush in the nebula where we, where we feel we might want some of that magenta tone. In fact, let's uh, kind of hit it lightly around the flame nebula as well. I think I want a bigger brush, bigger and softer even. So that's quite big. I'm going to drop the hardness down even more. 15. And uh, maybe increase the opacity of it. But put it down a little more slowly. Reduce the flow. And I'm just going to kind of sweep across this area. I haven't done it yet, but so this will add a little bit more of the magenta cast out to the right of the horse head nebula as if it's kind of affecting that area of the sky more, but not so much the below it. And then we'll kind of go in between the flame nebula and the horse head. I think that's probably pretty good. Hit the upper edges of the screen a little. Still brushing around the flame nebula some. Okay, what does the mask look like that we're working with? That. So, sort of a concentrated impact as intended on, on the nebulas themselves, a little bit less around the fringe areas. Alt click to get that back. Do a little more here between them. This video is almost as long as my original, and yet I did at least a few a few less steps. Let's go with that. Okay. Uh, 
I turn on the under, underlying layers, does that do anything? No. Oh, yeah, it does. Okay. Okay, the color fill. Yeah, that's fine. So I made the, the layer copy. That was just to get the inverted result. And then the color fill to divide against it. But once I've got the merge result of what those two are, they are no longer needed. So that's completely fine. So what we do want is the merge result of the two that we see. So be sure I've got everything else turned off in the add merged layer from visible. So now we should be able to turn those off and everything looks fine. Um, kind of curious now with that tint removed, if I can boost things a little with some curves, I'm just going to go in with, without, well, it's still safer to do layers. They're easy to tweak if you wish. Grab our scrubbing tool. Go into the magentas of the nebula. Whoa. And that, if you overdo it, then that shows where our prior edits were. Come back out then to the dark space. Almost kind of seesawing back and forth between the two. Um, that's actually a good reason, I think, here to actually go back to the prior color layers. So let's turn off the merge layer we created. And I'm going to turn on the mask layer and the underlying original. keeping the curves layer that we're working on to boost the reds, the magentas. How do I, how do I do that? It needs to be linked to the prior layer. So let me get rid of this intermediate layer that I had. Um, I may need to start fresh on the curves layer so it is linked to the other two. Okay, so that's where we're at. I'm going to bring this, I'm gonna, well, no, I'll leave that layer there. Just I like to leave the layers in place because it kind of shows me what happened between them. I don't need the two that are <coughs> turned off though. But hmm. let's see how it works. Since this mask has revealed more of the underlying nebula, I'm not sure if when I apply curves and they go up on the mask layer how that will affect things only way to know is to try it curves layer select my scrubbing tool get that horse head nebulosity okay it does still brighten there that's good that's what i'm after too much though yeah it's clipping off up there if I'd pay attention to my curves let me reset the curve and do that again so start bumping it up watching the curve not wanting to clip it
That's better. Stop it right there. And see that starts to kind of make some of the other nebulosity out here that we were exposing maybe a little more visible. I might actually kind of want to see it blacker there again. Let's see if we can drag that down. Not quite the way I wanted. So instead, what I'm going to do is go back to our mask and we'll paint that with white to remove a little bit more in here. So just reverse our swatches. We're still on the brush tool. Just brush back out some of that area so that the mask is affecting it. over here it looks like we've got can't tell if that's my screen or if we've actually got some bright values around here so I'm kind of undoing what I did earlier to some extent let's see if it I think that probably looks pretty good. Okay, so now we will merge all those three visible layers into a new layer. Now that's interesting. The result we got was more than I expected. undo that not sure why that was oh it's because I had I was on the wrong active layer so the merge was actually just the three below it I believe let's try that again yeah so it wasn't factoring in the curves yet okay so with this done we're going to go and save as a new layer. I'm just going to replace one I had earlier. Um, Sear edit. Yes. Don't save it compressed. That way it saves as quickly as possible. And we'll open StarNet on that file. Let's see if it'll work for me this time. Earlier it did not, using my shortcut. So we'll send that to StarNet++. And 64 worked pretty well on it before, but it was slow. I want to try a little bit larger and go with 92 or 96 rather. Okay. Accept that and it still crashed. Darn it. Okay. So Starnet is not working via my shortcut and therefore we'll open a new window. And the to keep it simpler, just gonna rename this file a.tiff. Drag it over into the StarNet window, replacing the previous a.tiff I've got. I guess my b.tiff I moved back out earlier and renamed it to the starless file. So there we go. Copy. Whoops.
and my batch file run run RGB starnet. This one here. We want to edit that and change the file name to that. I'm going to run a larger stride of 96 to speed things up some. I should have just stuck with the original name. I think I will. I'll just <laughs> stick with B rather than worry about punctuating it. Okay. And then run RGB Starless. Still pretty slow. So while that's running, I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, Starnet has just finished processing. It took about four or five minutes, probably about five. Output file is B, and I'm just going to rename that now to HHRS stacked serless. Move it back to the original working directory for purposes of better organization. And now drag that into Photoshop, where I've got an existing copy that I should close. Okay. Okay, and there's our result. And it made a mess of the those big kind of blooming stars. So we definitely want to be careful of how we make use of this. But basically, I, I like how it cleaned out the Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula. So I'm just going to work with that as provided. And what we'll do is just drag that layer into our master file and drop it shift and release so it stays aligned. And then we're going to put a mask on it and go back to our black brush. still big and soft and we're going to brush back in some details such as the stars actually these bigger ones so they don't look quite so crummy and then lightly hit around the fringes of the nebula to start restoring some sense of realism to the overall edit Now what I could have done before even doing that, I could have made some color changes. Well, actually I still can because I'm just painting things away to reveal what's underneath. Which I think that looks pretty good. Probably here at the top of the horse head, we want some stars still to kind of overlay in there. That looks better. Just right at the edge, it's just kind of grazing over it. That looks good, I'd say. Okay, so that done. Okay, I was confused. Okay. Um, starless. It's confused where that layer got dropped because I didn't name it. So we can still edit that starless layer and potentially brighten things up a bit more. So let's just put a uh, curved layer above that. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's, that's okay. So boost things a little. It, 
you know, it kind of brings out some noise there in the magenta colors of the horse head. What does that do? Just some subtle edits. I think I like that pretty well. Mike could brush away a little bit of the nebulosity there at the kind of base of the horse, but kind of a judgment call. Not sure. Let's see if our mask, maybe we did do that earlier. Let's take a look at our mask here. Yeah, I did brush some of that away. Let me see what it looks like to brush it back with some white. I may favor that. sure that it made any difference. It mostly uh, just hid some of the stars. I wonder, is that Yeah, we definitely added in some nebulosity there. So it looks like what I need is actually to brush away more with black. Yeah, that's what it was. I think that probably looks a little better. Let's go with that. Um, I don't like those big spots in the nebula. Of course, some stars came out. So let's maybe give it back a few stars. That's the wrong place. Oh, that... Uh, Earlier curves edit two was the wrong that was the wrong place. Um disable the layer mask. Yeah. Don't want that. Delete the layer mask. What I meant to do was edit my starless. So we're still on the black brush. We want a larger brush. And come along the bottom there. And hit those spots on the nebula maybe to
give it back a few stars. Trying to decide, is it better to have a few stars on the nebula versus blend them out? The thing is, you some of them, you know, at close inspection, you see all, you do see some of these spots that don't look so good. I think a few larger stars look more natural, but uh, I'm going to select the spot tool go for a little bit larger size get off the mask which I'm on yeah there we go and let's just hit some of those spots and spot retouch it out interesting I guess in some ways that uh, starting to see these spots does almost have me thinking that starless nebula just looks a little too fake without more stars. So that being said, I'm going to reselect the mask, go with a larger brush again, and add some stars in. Oh, I'm still on the spot tool. Okay, uh, so the problem here is basically that Starless uh, Starnet, it, maybe the stride size I use of 96 was a little too coarse. It seemed like it left quite a few little donuts around, but the best way to hide that result is actually just reveal the stars more again. I think that's still f fewer stars than it would appear without that. That's an hour and 35 minute editing session. <laughs> it's come from bad to worse. So I'm just going to call that good. with the one thing I'll change. Let's go ahead and do one more merge visible, merge of visible. And it's the wrong place again, dang nabbit. Yeah. Doing it too fast. Let me get that back. Get rid of that. Okay. Add merge of visible. Now I'll turn everything off. And let's see if we can get back here to a point where we can compare. Okay. So there's the more starry 
versus starless reduction. And actually, it would look better to have more stars at least in open space. So let's just do that as our final step. We'll erase a few more with that underlying layer showing through. Big brush. Bigger. Okay. Yeah, it just, it looks better having more stars as long as they are not all on your area of biggest interest, but just kind of feathered over into it. So now how does that compare? That's better. Okay, let's go with that. Okay, here I was, uh, actually painting back in some stars to fill some of this space out on the right. Thought I was done. And I just remembered the one thing I still wanted to do. It's not, uh, I, the image is pretty nice as it is, but nonetheless, I still like to crop it to really just give emphasis to the nebulas more with a little less space in the picture. Still like kind of like the idea of keeping that star in there on the right. That leaves a little less black space. Okay, we'll go with that. 